Hi everyone, I'm Brian Stevens, Director of Exhibitions of the Peterson Automotive Museum. And I'm Leslie Kendall, Chief Historian of the Peterson Automotive Museum. And we are here on the third floor of the museum, the Otis Booth History Floor. We're here to talk about cars and why cars are so fascinating to people in Los Angeles. At the Peterson Automotive Museum, the first thing that people see when they get to the third floor are these vehicles. A couple of incredibly shiny cars. They look like Porsches, but they're not. They are similar to Porsches, and they were inspired by Porsches, but they are Rungis. Uh, the Rungi RS, Spider also as it's known, and the Rungi RS010. We're here in our introduction gallery, and this is really, as Leslie said, the first thing that people see when they walk into the museum. They come up to the third floor, um, they start here and then they delve into the history of the automobile, the industry of the, of the automotive industry, that is, etc. Chris Rungi being an amazing craftsman and coach builder uh, based out of Minnesota who creates completely bespoke one-off creations, um, each commissioned by an individual buyer to reflect Chris's personal ideal uh, of the German sports cars of the 1950s. When we drive around cities on an everyday basis, the car the world of the automobile kind of looks a little bit bland, just sort of um, Cars are a mode of, of transportation from point A to point B and nothing more, utilitarian. Um, when you see something like this, you realize that the automotive world really is still a place of creativity, um, of innovation. It's possible to still produce very, very unique things, uh, very beautiful things. It's a place of pleasure and enjoyment, and I think these cars exemplify that. And these are also the kinds of vehicles that you're more likely to see in Los Angeles than just about anywhere else. You might not be lucky enough to see these vehicles, but you're gonna see a lot of cars that you probably will see nowhere else because that's what LA is. It's about our automotive landscape. So we use the Rungis in our introduction gallery to really set up uh, enthusiasm for the automobile and our visitors before we quickly move into uh, the history of the automobile where we give people a little bit of background before moving on through the floor. And it really helps people understand the automobile when they understand where it came from. For example, we have a silhouette on the wall from the world's first car built in 1769. And we have in front of us a recreation of the 1886 Benz, the first practical automobile that was intended for people to ride in. And this is actually one of a small number of, of very accurate replicas that was built, correct? That are in, in, now in a small number of museums around the world? That's right, only about 50 of these were built and we we're lucky enough to, to have one. And thanks to Mr. Peterson, our major benefactor, he made sure we have all of the important things. So continuing our historical progression that began over here with the 1769 Cugno on the wall and the 1886 Benz uh, in the foreground, we now move over here to the 1903 Cadillac, which was produced a uh, mere 17 years after the Benz, but is a vastly different automobile. And Cadillac wasn't always what we think of it today. This, in fact, is a one-cylinder car that was built in series. The Benz wasn't. The Benz was a one-of-a-kind car, but by this time, Manufacturers were starting to build cars uh, that look like each other for public sale. And it kind of exemplifies how the old cars, you sat on them, you really didn't get into them. So when we reconceived the Peterson Museum in 2014, 2015, we decided that on our history floor, although we wanted to set it up with a little bit of early, early history showing the 1769, the 1886, the 1903 cars, after that point, we wanted to transition away from a pure chronology, which uh, in many museums is the approach to telling history. Instead of showing a pure chronology, we decided that we wanted to display cars in this area, what we call our perspectives gallery, um, in five different themes, reflecting five different ways that people have come to love the automobile. And within each of those five different ways, we have a pairing of vehicles, some that people are gonna recognize, some that people are not gonna recognize, and that's what we like about the Peterson Museum. We want people to see what they expect to see and are hoping to see, but we also want to teach them. We want to, want to show them something that's a little bit uh, out of the box that they didn't, maybe they didn't know was out there, but they're sure glad they heard about. Style, innovation, freedom, utility, and distinction. Now these are just five of what really are many reasons people have come to love the automobile. I personally think that fun is missing. I love to drive for the pleasure of it. Um, competition is another one that's not identified here. 
um, but we did feel that these five were especially important reasons why people have come to love the automobile. And within each of those five, as Leslie mentioned, we have pairings of cars uh, that exemplify those five reasons. Uh, in each of them also we have a pre-war car, pre-World War II that is, and a post-war car. And we're starting here in the style section what is the most apparent thing about the automobile, and that is how it looks. Uh, and for this particular section, we paired a 1939 uh, Bugatti with the first series Jaguar E-Type, both grand touring sporting cars of their day, both very long-legged cars. This, both double overhead cams, this is straight eight, the Jaguar is a straight six. Very British, very French. Again, they exemplify the motoring traditions of their respective countries. Cars, we think, are clothing. You put on a car, you just don't get into it, especially in Los Angeles. This is how you say hello to the world, uh, because most people get their first impression of you in Southern California from what you're driving. When you think of how, what California is and what it means, we have a lot of touring opportunities. There are lots of reasons to drive your car. There's the ocean, the desert, the, uh, the mountains, there's Sunset Boulevard, and there's a car for every, every purpose. So we're here now in our innovation section, uh, and we have two cars that really uh, showcase um, what's sort of weird and wonderful about the history of innovation in automotive development. Uh, sometimes the most fascinating cars and the most innovative cars aren't necessarily the ones that ended up succeeding in the marketplace. Um, like this Hoffman, uh, 1935 Hoffman X8, the only one ever built, um, one might say or think that because it was the only one ever built, it was a failure, but in a way, uh, it was ex an extremely forward-thinking car that may have influenced other cars in the marketplace uh, and certainly um, showcased really, really creative and uh, innovative thinking at the time. Well, you make an excellent point because innovation has to start somewhere. S somebody has to be the first person to think outside the box. And Mr. Hoffman certainly did because this car is interesting not only for what it looks like, which is certainly a little bit strange from the mid-30s, but also because it's powered by an X8 engine, which means it has four banks of two cylinders each arranged in an X pattern. Now, Henry Ford even experimented with that. They put them in cars, but they were never intended to be fully functional. Got it. Uh, this is a fully functional prototype, um, and even General Motors experimented with an X8, but it was kind of a modified X8 because one of the cylinders was was used for uh, as a valve mm, for the for the other uh, the other cylinder the other cylinder it paired with what helps lock it into place is if you can picture in your mind a 1935 Ford then put it next to this car and you'll see how advanced the Hoffman was in appearance compared to the 35 Ford and it wasn't just looking different to, for the sake of looking different People were driving faster and faster. Engines were getting more and more powerful. The roads were improving to the point where you could really realistically go 45, 50, 55, 60 miles an hour. Uh, and this car could do that a lot more cleanly than your average Ford, Chevy, or Buick. So here we've moved from our innovation section to the freedom section of our perspectives gallery. And in this area, we look at, in this case, three automobiles. It is um, each illustrating a different aspect of freedom uh, throughout automotive history and different meanings that freedom has had from throughout automotive history. Starting with the Model T Ford, uh, built at a time in which freedom really meant just the ability to, to, to move at all. Uh, Brian, you're right about that. And Henry Ford wanted people to get out there and explore the great American wilderness, explore the, the vast continent that was North America. And he felt that the best way to do it was with a car like this, the Model T, built from 1908 to 1927, more than 15 million were built, a wildly successful car that you could credit really with putting America on wheels. And by the time this came out in the late teens, you're building hardtops, you had sedans, you had convertibles, you had all different kinds of body configurations. And this one is especially notable for being a hardtop, which means that when these windows are down, there's no B pillar to obstruct your inward or outward vision. It's my understanding that this particular body style with the, the open side without the B pillar is actually incredibly rare and that this is maybe one of less than 10 of this in existence, of this type in existence. You're right, it's called a cupolette. That's what Ford called it. The cupolettes were originally convertibles, the top went down, but that was too expensive for Ford because Ford wanted to give people cars, but he wanted to give them 
inexpensively. So what Ford did was they said, enough with the convertible, it's too expensive, let's make it a hard top. So all of a sudden, the coupelette went from a convertible to a hard top, but the name didn't change. Very few of these were built, fewer survived, and we're very fortunate that this was donated so many years ago. Over here, we move uh, post-World War II uh, to the 1950s, where we uh, have a Corvette. And at this point in time, pretty much everybody, I mean, not literally everybody, but pretty much everybody was getting around. And that idea, uh, the idea of freedom had transitioned uh, in meaning to be something else, especially in America. Cars became a little bit more about having fun, and mm -hmm. they also became a little bit more about projecting an aura of success mm -hmm. to your neighbors and to everybody anyone out on the road to see you. And what better way to do this than in a 1956 Corvette? Now Corvette was the first mass produced fiberglass car to come from a major manufacturer. There had been other fiberglass cars before, but nobody had tried it on this massive scale until GM did it in 1953. And this is one uh, Corvette was in its fourth year by 1956. And you, you can tell that chrome had kind of taken over. Uh, there was a little bit of bling to it. It's like, it's like the automotive equivalent of a, of a gold chain or, uh, or, or some other physical accoutrement like that. So would you say that over here, you have the freedom simply to move about, and by the 1950s, you have the freedom to move about while enjoying it and looking good doing it? <laughs> the freedom to move about, the freedom to be yourself. Perfect. And then right next to the Corvette, we have a car amazingly built only one year earlier than the Corvette in a very different part of the world. After World War II, Japan was a very different place than it is today. Uh, they used raw materials very, very uh, sparingly. Gas was expensive. The roads were narrower. So this kind of a car made perfect sense. And it was actually Japan's first fiberglass car. These are all built of fiberglass and it was Fuji Cabin's idea of a step up from a scooter. Immediately after World War II, Japanese roads were full of scooters. It was a way to get around. This was essentially an enclosed scooter. Sure, it had three wheels like a scooter, but it also had an enclosed body and only one door, which was on the left-hand side. And if you wanted ventilation, you took out the windows. You didn't roll them down. Certainly the most adorable car in the museum. I think uh, that's pretty much universally agreed by our visitors. I think, I think it's the most huggable car Definitely. in the museum. It's, it's, it's kind of cute and it's the only, one of the very few we have with a center headlight. So a lot of people appreciate automobiles for the style they convey. I mentioned earlier that I appreciate cars for the fun that they, they provide me. Um, for a whole lot of people, and this holds true today, uh, automobiles are useful and valuable because of the utility they offer. They are useful. You don't just drive around in your car yourself anymore. You use your car for lots of different things, for hauling lumber out of a car made with lumber. Back in the day, the best way, the cheapest way to make a small production vehicle was with wood. This car is indeed a, uh, a predecessor to the modern SUVs. Uh, not so much S, but certainly a lot of the UV. Not a lot of sporting in this, mm -hmm. but, but a lot of the utility. Take a look at the car, and you th there, there are things that we take for granted today, like roll down windows and glass. These are snap-in side curtains made of fabric and a uh, transparent material. And you also had your spare tire on the fenders. Uh, moving over here to the post-war side in our utility section, um, we have the Willis Jeep station wagon, which if I understand correctly, was actually significant in its use of metal for the entire body and might have been one of the first mass produced cars of this type to not use wood. Indeed, one of the first. Um, Willie said, you know what, this isn't working for our program. Wood is too expensive. We're a manufacturer that's best known for uh, inexpensive vehicles. Uh, so let's make one inexpensively and we can sell it that way too. And it also exemplifies the fact that in this era, station wagons are only two-door vehicles. Uh, later on, they became four doors, but really this is again an, a nod to the utility. It really wasn't about passenger comfort yet. It was about getting things around, getting your camping gear around and looking kind of cool doing it. And initially you could have this painted to look like wood. That went away very quickly. People said, oh, forget it. It's paint, let's just admit it, paint it all one color. I have to admit, it's a pretty classy way to go. Think of the circumstances that guided American needs. We had long ribbons of open road and that the Corvette was perfect for. Um, but then when you got off the road, even 50 feet, uh, you're, you're 
all of a sudden your mid-50s Buick just wasn't cutting it anymore and you needed something with a lot more uh, shock absorber travel that was a lot more rugged, something that uh, could take those bumps, could climb over those rocks. And uh, Willys and, and Jeep made a market out of that. They made a fortune giving people that exact thing. It says, let's give them freedom, let's give them utility with their freedom mm -hmm. and, and uh, we'll make millions of them and indeed they did. We also have a comparison, post-war America utility, post-war Japan utility. And again, like with the Fuji and the Corvette, we have a, it's quite a contrast. <laughs> In Japan, licensing and taxation is charged according to the size of the car. Again, thinking that America needs were guided by open roads mm -hmm. and long swaths of pavement. Japanese needs were guided by very narrow streets, very expensive fuel, very expensive raw materials. Japan was an island. They had to get everything they had from, from essentially overseas. So they, they really couldn't um, lavish a lot of raw materials in a vehicle and then lavish the gasoline to get them around. What you had is a class of K car that fit a certain, not only category of engine capacity, but also a size category. Because if you got much bigger than this, if you probably got even an inch bigger in either direction, you were in an entirely new tax bracket with a car like this. I do think it's interesting that it, that, that class, classification and, and size of car still persists today, very commonly in Japan. It's not like this fell out of favor, you know, in the, in the 60s. Um, it's still seen as advantageous in many ways to operate cars of that size and capacity. And there's yep. still places in Japan, you mm -hmm. have to prove that you have a parking space before you can buy a car. And it's a lot easier to prove you had a parking for this mm -hmm. than that. The last of our five perspective sections is distinction. Uh, and distinction, I think, is actually fairly easily confused with style. Uh, stylish things are also distinctive, but um, here we look at distinction a little bit differently. Uh, you can be stylish, but not necessarily distinctive. You can have a, a, a car that is stylish, but very, very commonplace. Uh, in this area, we look at people who, or we look at cars that are used by people to really stand out. Um, whether they're stylish or not is a different story, but they're certainly unique. Uh, and all throughout, auto, all throughout automotive history, um, certain, certain members of the population have gravitated toward cars that make them stand out in the crowd. Um, going way back to, the, to 1914 here in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles in 1914, manufacturers began to realize that bright colors sold cars, uh, wire wheels sold cars, step plates instead of running boards sold cars. So Mr. G.M. Kennedy decided that he would take a car called Little Princess, or later The Princess, that was built in Detroit, essentially a cycle car, that was really plain looking and doll it up. So he painted it a bright color. He gave it those cycle fenders. He gave it uh, the step place instead of running board. Uh, and he put a California top on it, which is a removable hard top on an otherwise open uh, roadster or touring car. And as long as you're gonna put a California top on it, why not give it nine bevel glass windows in the back to look through? It was really a valiant effort, but this car cost $5,000 when the car upon which it was based didn't even cost a thousand. He was on the right track, but maybe just a little bit too soon. And this was tailored to the extroverted, as we talked about earlier, Los Angeles market, correct? With the assumption that buyers in LA will be more interested in something distinctive than, than buyers in other parts of the country, maybe. Well, we talked about Hollywood and Hollywood projecting an image. And part of that image uh, of Los Angeles and Los Angeles automotive culture was the distinctive automobile, something that you really wouldn't see anywhere else. You, it would be difficult to picture this car in Boston in, in a January winter in the mid-teens. So in contrast to the 1914 Petite Special over here, uh, we have another very distinctive car, the 1965 Adams Vivant 77. And if you haven't heard of the Adams Vivant 77, or even Adams for that matter, I think you could be forgiven. This is a one-off car built by a Pontiac engineer in the 1960s. Uh, using a significant number of Pontiac parts, but obviously a very, very unique body. He designed, it's my understanding, what he felt to be the ideal sports car, the ideal in beauty, the ideal in engineering. He referenced other cars that were built around the same time period, some very famous Alfa Romeos. During the mid-50s, Bertoni built a series of Alfa Romeos called the BAT, Berliner Aerodynamica Technica, a series of vehicles. When aerodynamics was becoming more of a science and less of an art, 
But we think this car combines the two really, really nicely. It's got the crazy fins from, a, from the bygone era, and it's got a lot of mid-60s Pontiac in the front. You can see where designers took their inspiration going back to the 50s Alfa Romeo Bat cars, and then where they lent their inspiration, for example, like on the, the front grille of this, of this vehicle. And what better color to present it than this? It was it, it, ideal for the time, really spoke to the era. So now we've moved on from our perspectives gallery into the, the back corner of the third floor, into an area that we use consistently to talk about dream cars. Uh, dream cars, uh, that's something that came about in the 1950s originally, correct? After World War II, uh, it went from a seller's market to a buyer's market in not a lot of time, and it was necessary for manufacturers to stand out. And today we call them uh, concept cars, mm -hmm. but back then they called them dream cars. The three that we have here right now are not in fact produced by major brands, but they still are very similar in that they were very forward-thinking concepts uh, that tried to get buyers to uh, look into the future to see what the future might hold uh, in terms of automotive technology and styling. And um, they certainly uh, exude optimism for the future, um, sort of that, in this case, at least a bit of the space age aesthetic from the, the early post-war era. Um, these three were all designed by one designer, Brooks Stevens. Uh, he actually designed another car we saw earlier, uh, the Willis Jeep station wagon. That's probably one of his better known, more common designs. But all three of these very unique automobile, automobiles were also designed by Brooks Stevens. Um, the first one, uh, called the Paxton Phoenix, was actually built here in Los Angeles. And in some ways, it was kind of like the Hoffman we saw earlier in that it was uh, it, 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 all in under one body. You had all of these very unique innovations. Um, power plant was one. They, they, this car was seen potentially as a way of bringing back steam power. This, they had envisioned uh, a, a lot of different ways to motivate this car. Originally, it was mm -hmm. steam, uh, turbine, um, mm -hmm. uh, different configurations of uh, piston engines. Uh, but they ended up putting a Porsche engine in the back of the car, and some people call this the Paxton Porsche, mm -hmm. where it's really just the Paxton. They happen to have used a, a Porsche engine. But what helps make this car distinctive is the material that was used to construct it, which was fiberglass. And I suppose you could say that this kind of car, these three that we're featuring this time, um, were meant to attract manufacturers mm -hmm. To, uh, to specialty companies that could supply you um, with a certain kind of design techniques, a certain kind of um, uh, material with which to build your car, and a, a, new, a, a new way of punching through the air uh, as sleekly as you possibly could. And over here, uh, we have the scimitar, which uh, is important also for the material that it was made from uh, significantly, just like fiberglass here was important. This one was made from aluminum, also retractable hard top. This was built for Olin aluminum, and that's what the OA on the front means. Uh, Olin had three of these uh, designed by Brooks Stevens. This car, a four-door retractable hard top, and a four-door station wagon. This, the two-door retractable hard top, operates as, as you would expect it. And unlike the bare aluminum, the polished bare aluminum that is on the rungis we saw in the beginning, here we have exposed brushed aluminum. And in this case, it's not purely for style, it's to, to sort of showcase the promise of aluminum as, as a material for constructing cars. Olin Aluminum was trying to sell the uh, ma major manufacturers on the idea of using aluminum. It was lightweight, sure it costs mm -hmm. more, but in this configuration, it looked kind of sexy. It was brushed aluminum, and the idea was to have brushed aluminum panels that were identical from car to car, and the, and the uh, steel panels that, that were painted uh, would be different. For example, the roof would be different, the trunk would be slightly uh, differently configured. And, uh, but all with the same theme, and a lot of people look at the front and they think Edsel, but I think you have to admit it's a little bit more attractive than the Edsel ever got to be. <laughs> so one more Brooks Stevens design here. This is the Studebaker Scepter prototype. Maybe a little bit more subtle than some of the other Brooks Stevens cars we just looked at, but when you start noticing the details, you realize how amazingly unique uh, this car was. By the early 1960s, Studebaker was starting to falter, and they thought, we really need something to, to 
perk up our line. So let's get this industrial designer, Brooke Stevens, in, and he can build something that maybe we could never even have thought of. And you'll notice what Brooke Stevens did with this car. He took advantage of what he knew to be innovations in a lot of things, including the headlights, because they got together with Sylvania, and Sylvania was supposed to come out with a certain kind of headlight that would have fit perfectly behind these clear panels in the bottom. Just another thing to show that Studebaker was thinking ahead. I think you really have to see the interior of this car. Um, the exterior, as I mentioned, is somewhat subtle, but the interior with the metallic upholstery and these sort of spherical um, gauges, really, it, 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 it recalls the, the space age, and the enthusiasm for space travel and space exploration. I mean, it looks like something out of the Jetsons, although the exterior might, may be a little bit less so. Um, but the, uh, the, the interior, it looks like a spaceship. What's also amazing is how original this car is. It's never been restored. It's always had these, these fabrics. It's always had this paint on it. And that's what the Peterson Museum is about. We are about originality. We've made our way to our Hollywood gallery, which is the last gallery on our third floor that we're going to be looking at today. Uh, you might wonder what a Hollywood gallery is doing on a history floor. Well, actually, if you think about it, Hollywood, the movie industry, has evolved almost in parallel with the automotive industry. The timing works out, and we, don't, we weren't making movies in 1769 when the Cugnot came about, but the, the bulk of the history of the automobile and the history of the movie industry overlap. The first time it was possible, they started using cars in movies, mm -hmm. and nothing can establish a time and a place better than an automobile. For example, this Woody Packard from the Jim Crow South, nothing speaks to that era of the 50s like a used station wagon. Automobiles have played just an enormous number of roles in movies uh, and not just uh, not just the characters they play in a sense but also they serve different purposes, they have different out different effects and outcomes. Um, we talked earlier about uh, cars and movies kind of setting up the idea of style and glamour. A glamorous car in a movie uh, ends up translating to the idea of glamorous cars in the everyday world conveying uh, certain uh, tastes. Um, they're, uh, cars uh, like this end up um, becoming characters in a way. Uh, this is the uh, Cadillac Miller Meteor from um, Ghostbusters Afterlife. We have the very famous DeLorean from Back to the Future down there. In many ways, a more famous character in that film than any of the characters themselves. And sometimes cars can be found by producers and directors, cars that exist at that point in time that, that work just right for the script or for the storyline or for the aesthetic of the movie. Sometimes cars have to be invented from scratch because there is nothing out on the market uh, that serves the purpose needed. For example, over here, a monocycle from Men in Black, although the concept of a monocycle has existed uh, for, for many, many decades, it's a, a great example of a true fantasy vehicle, something that was dreamt, dreamt up in the minds of a production designer, um, of an of a, of a automotive stylist to serve the, the purpose needed in the film. Thanks so much for joining us today on our tour of the third floor of the Peterson Museum. Uh, although it may seem like we've talked about a lot, we've actually only barely scratched the surface of everything that there is to be discovered and learned here on the third floor. So you'll just have to come yourself and witness Los Angeles automotive history, Los Angeles automotive culture, and we hope to see you soon at the Peterson Museum. <laughs>